Um, it can give a treatment strategy or plan and then some associated information and education. But none of those things in and of themselves um, actually result in health. Uh, but they are the things over which the healthcare system has the most control and influence. So they're the things that we focus on and do the best that we can um, to make them have the, the optimal uh, uh, effect on the patient's life. And I think that the cumulative complexity model, which was, I think, um, you know, briefly referenced yesterday, is a way of conceptualizing really how we can modify treatment plans and, and strategies to fit the things that fit the capacity of a patient, the context of a patient's life. So that we have the best chance of, of getting the outcomes that um, that we all want to see, um, and and my first um, actual project of uh, research really, well, my first oh, project I owned, I suppose, um, uh, was 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 related to trying to um, tease apart whether this is true, and sort of sort of validating in some ways this model. And looking at the ways that different healthcare systems and providers had used different treatment strategies uh, and modified them to improve patient outcomes. So I thought I would summarize that partly as an effort to reminisce about how I came to do any of this stuff. And then, um, and then also, um, uh, because some of you in the room may be really wait to do that. So what, what, we, what we've done like five years ago um, was we, we've taken um, all of the randomized trials of different um, um, interventions that people had tried to reduce 30 day hospitalizations. It was a, a, a big focus at the time, which was a lot of policy and transportation. And so, what we did is we tried to describe all of those interventions um, by breaking them down into their individual components. So, you can't really probably read the table on the right, but what that's representing is some of the things that were tried, and they were almost always tried, bundled together in different um, you know, constellations and, and um, trying to address uh, different things, although sometimes they were tried in isolation. Um, and so we had 42 different randomized trials. We described all of those different components, and then we described the, the entire um, intervention itself and rated it on its perceived impact um, um, and Francis is actually in for participating in this, um, rated that this um, potential impact of, of increasing patient's capacity. And what we saw, um, again, I know you can't um, begin to read what's on the right there, but that's just a poor slide of all of the different um, studies that we looked at. Um, and you can see if you were to average those out, um, those little dots that they go more toward the right, then they um, suggest that uh, um, there's less of an effect if they more toward the left that suggests the benefits of the intervention. And you can see it's kind of a mixed bag, but um, what you can find is that some of them are much more effective than others. And the things that we found were effective were whenever an intervention did was rated to increase patient capacity, whenever it was delivered by more than one person, meaning that we're working together and usually from different perspectives, seeing different aspects of a patient's life. And then it had five or more different activities. So it's this idea of comprehensiveness. Usually these were complementary um, interventions that approach the patient, um, patient, different aspects of the patient's life to try to address the, um, the patient more comprehensively. And so what we did was we actually thought, well, wow, if all of these things are good, um, what happens if you do all of them? The more that you do, it should be even better. And sure enough, that's what we found. So um, we made a variable <laughs> that looked at these things that seemed to matter. And then we tested whether or not it was true that if, if these things are included to an increasing degree, does it result in an increasing benefit? And, and it, it did. So what we called collaborative and comprehensive care um, if you use three or four of these um, uh, variables, resulted in a relative risk of readmission of 0.63, which is a pretty significant impact on the higher than the and I don't think on average.
But what I, what I want to get across, um, and this is what at the time really sparked um, in me this sort of idea, was that um, effective care emphasized the assessment and addressing of factors related to patient context and capacity for self care. And what I think that looks like, and what I would, how I would summarize it, especially more reflection I've had over the years, is that the most effective care aims to extend healthcare sphere of influence into the context of patients' lives so as to optimize their capacity for health. And actually, the single most effective interventions we could find always went and visited the patient in their house, in their home, and found out where they lived and tried to understand their life and that perspective. <coughs> So um, I think that makes sense, actually. I mean, and since that time, as a field, come to know that that should make sense. Um, so we know that medical care, as it's typically delivered, comes from the kind of um, people's overall health. So um, the behaviors, social circumstances, and the amount of times I've seen that said the social circumstances and the environment <laughs> will not stay. Where you can move in one single way. But, anyways, um, those account for a much higher um, proportion of people's health. Um, and I think those things can best be summarized as capacity and content. I mean, that's what we're talking about, really. We're talking about, you know, the, the lives that the situations that people live in and their ability to thrive within them. But if you think about Juan, or, or any patient that you, you might have or know about this struggling or friend or family member, you know, how do you yourself systematically go about influencing their behaviors, social circumstances, and environment? I mean, it's a huge daunting task, um, but a problem that I've really gravitated toward. Like I said, patients have problems that we can't. And if that's true, then maybe there are other people that need to be involved in a meaningful way for people to do well. So I, I feel like there's only certain things that I can do that are going to help someone. But this is Alma and Magda. So um, these are real people. They live here in the Rochester community. Um, uh, Alma um, has a background in, in health promotion um, and was very active in her church. Magna actually um, uh, has diabetes um, and they uh, speak Spanish. They are of um, the same descent and they um, uh, have been trying to deliver a, uh, a diet, an evidence based diabetes self management program. So, Delivered any place in the community. So <laughs> before we go on, I'd, I'd like for you guys to tell me um, what are some of the things that you think Alma and Magda can do for one that I could not or we could not within the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Speak your language. Speak your language, that's a good start. Yeah. I think they could potentially connect him with an enormous number of resources that they know for, for, from their experience. And so, yeah, connecting them with resources, just they know from their experience of living in this place. Um, yeah, what else? They, they may have more empathy for his background, um, understand some of the nuances of his cultural uh, requirements. So things that we probably can't even know um, that uh, you know, empathizing uh, and understanding his cultural background and, and whatever that leads to, but we probably can't even predict. I think one of the things that maybe it would lead to is for him to feel less alone. <laughs> feel less alone, exactly. So now he's got some social um, connections and he's less isolated potentially. Maybe he develops actual friends. So um, I think the evidence would bear out uh, at least three things that all the men are going to provide, um, particularly in the context of, of uh, this group, a group-based diabetes self-management program in a community setting with a bunch of people that speak Spanish that one's never met before. 
many of whom had diabetes and are trying to struggle, or in the state sort of situation he is, um, and are struggling to, to live with it and, 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 and do well. So um, they're going to provide knowledge, but it's going to be a different sort of knowledge than we're going to provide in the healthcare system. Um, they're going to have the street smarts of both living with diabetes, but also living in Rochester, um, <coughs> not speaking English particularly well, or, or maybe knowing where to get good, healthy food that they like to, like to eat. Um, they're going to have uh, be able to give one um, experience. Um, and by that, I mean experience in um, doing the things he needs to do to self-manage his diabetes. So they'll provide some training, but they'll also check in on him and he gets to actually practice some of the strategies that we know um, will be helpful to him. And then, of course, there's social support. So he's going to actually develop relationships with people and develop friendships and make connections so that he feels less isolated and um, will be um, more comfortable in this community. So um, I think, you know, in summary, um, we're not anytime soon going to change what the healthcare system does. I think that in many ways may be okay. But what it doesn't seem okay to me is to neglect like opportunities to organize and equip those best positioned to influence and create health, which I believe are actually patients themselves, um, the caregivers that they have, and the communities in which they live. I don't know if. Um, um, so when I started thinking more and more about this, I started conceptualizing what would that actually look like? Um, I, I think very um, practically in the real world, how would we ever systematize that sort of, like if I could actually prescribe social relationships for you, or if I could actually prescribe that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll meet people that you'll, um, you'll have um, the knowledge that you need to self-manage your health, how do, you, how do you begin to do that? So um, I started thinking about this idea of operationalizing, operationalizing a community system that would complement our healthcare system. And I actually call it, in many ways, I think our healthcare system is a sick care system. So how do we develop a welfare system and how do we work together? Um, and I, I just I picked up on this yesterday that you know I don't. I don't think it should surprise us that the things patients feel most burdened by and are supported in the things the healthcare system is not designed to support. Um, and um, I believe the presentation yesterday highlighted, you know, patients feel that they don't know what to do with things that require self-management or anything behavioral. Um, and that's because if you get into a discussion about how human behavior works, but it's mostly influenced <laughs> by our social networks, our peer, the, the things that our peers model for us, um, our beliefs about ourselves, our self-advocacy, um, and, and that sort of thing. And the healthcare system can only do that to a certain degree. I don't know if we have time for a video, but um, um, we should. Yeah. I'll just for a few minutes. See if it even works. We're no, having pretty tests at this. I would say in any more on the bottom. Okay. We'll just watch um, a few minutes. This was an unfair trick to play. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of health issues. I was even going to say, feel sorry for myself. I didn't have an idea of how myself get off the field that I did. I think the biggest change I see after some has attended the class is that they're more empowered to take control of their chronic condition instead of the condition taking control of them. They have a better understanding that it's chronic, that it's not something we're going to fix with a pill or a diet or an exercise, that it's something that they're going to battle their entire life. 
there's something in these programs for everybody and they can be activated at all different kinds of levels and we can offer them all different kind of settings. It's like being with your family sitting in a living room talking about your disease. I mean, everybody has the same problem, everybody has the same struggle. For more than 30 years, evidence could <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if this is going to work, and that's okay. We don't need it. Um, we need the other. I want to make sure. Probably I should pause it. Yeah. So it <laughs> um, What it would have shown you was basically what this actually looks like um, when people get together and um, help each other um, <laughs> live well in the setting of chronic disease. And I became really impressed and um, um, impressed with this um, because they were evidence based. Um, and there was a lot of these things. Um, they cover all sorts of, you know, all of these self management or health promotion related interventions that could easily be delivered in a community setting and easily be referred to from the healthcare system. So um, I started to get um, excited because there was actually also funding um, uh, resources to deliver these to sort of, in the US context, different public health and, and dollars and things that are promoted that are distributed to support our promotion. So you can see the list of, of and this is just a sampling, really just a thin list of sorts of things that you can operationalize in community settings. And I thought they made, they made a lot of sense as a way to organize communities around them um, and then to think of, can we develop a community system based on these? And this just kind of summarizes some of the clinical outcomes and costs <laughs> so, so this is, um, for those of you that are not uh, local, this is uh, what Southeast Minnesota looks like. Um, Rochester that star in the middle. And so what um, we thought about trying to do was to develop a um, network of community-based organizations that could provide these sorts of um, programs as part of a single kind of unified community system, if you will. And we decided um, through some community-engaged research um, to develop kind of a hub organization that would coordinate all of that activity, um, which we call WellConnect. Um, so that, that hub is responsible for um, a few things, which includes training people from the communities to deliver these programs in the right sort of way. Um, and then, um, organizing uh, the technology platform that will allow them to work together um, and, and for the healthcare system to integrate with it in some semi-seamless way. Um, so the idea here was that any community organization, if it goes through the process to join this network, whether you're you know, um, a community center or a church or whatever, you could you know, find your place in helping your community do well and, and you can resource for the healthcare system as well. So we actually did a social network analysis of this after we had kind of gone live about a year later. And um, what you're seeing here, these blue dots represent community organizations and that IMT2 um, is our WellConnect hub. So only after um, a year, year and a half of existence, um, the, the size of the node represents the degree of um, centrality, basically the degree to which it is partnered with all of the other community organizations. So it was trying, it was more or less serving that role of a community hub that um, that the healthcare system could potentially interact with. What you also see is that the healthcare system and the community, for the most part, are quite isolated. They do not work together, um, and um, we were trying to as best we could to bridge that. We had limited but some success in doing that. And so this is um, what it looks like. We actually built a, um, a digital platform that um, 
has sort of a front end, which is public facing. So it allows um, people from the community to go and search for um, whatever programs might be available and register for them online. Um, it also allows a place for the clinic um, healthcare providers to refer patients to. Um, and then there's a back end that community organizations, people that have been trained and given permissions, can actually go in and it's, I call it, an, it's like an EHR for the community. Um, it's a place where they can keep track of who's being participated in the programs. Um, they can post when and where they're <laughs> happening. Um, it's a dynamic platform. And these are the things that Volcanic does, which I've already kind of described. Um, and so, in I think it was 2016, this was a summary of what we were able to accomplish. We had 14 different interventions that were delivered by 23 different organizations at 71 unique locations in all 11 counties in Southeast Minnesota by 120 trained leaders to about 800 participants and estimated, and this was very much estimated based off public literature, um, over $300,000 And so, like I mentioned, we, we developed the infrastructure that it was at least possible for um, healthcare practitioners um, and anyone really in the health services, uh, public health space to make referrals to them through, through the technology. And obviously we have this sort of vision for, for how this will operate. Um, <laughs> again, it's, it, the idea is that it would be a hub and that help any healthcare system that is it's not, you know, associated with a particular organization, but it's associated with the geography and all the people that are there. And that's the way that you would want it to operate. And so this is just a screenshot um, of what the uh, sort of back end looks like. So if you were a trained community leader, you can go in there and you could um, access all of your uh, programs that you're leading and keep track of your participants, and update your profile, and all of that stuff. So um, that's where we've gotten to. Um, I don't think that that's by any means the complete goal of future vision. I think we're still thinking about ways that we can actually do more. Um, uh, these evidence-based programs are great. They're the, the logical place to start, but it doesn't encompass everything, obviously, that, that's necessary or needed. And we know that some people, um, you know, for, they have transportation challenges or whatever, they can't make it to these. Um, so we thought a lot about that. What do we do about people that <coughs> capacity is even too low to go and do something like this? So um, I'm currently working on a, a National Cancer Institute funded um, project to uh, um, improve symptom management of uh, patients with cancer, basically is what it's about. Um, but as part of that, we are um, thinking about ways that we can support patients in managing their own symptoms in their homes and in their communities and even in other innovative ways. So how do you get people to benefit from the sort of street smarts of other people that have lived with cancer um, when they can't leave the house or something like that that becomes a challenge? So um, we actually have an online community of um, patients that have cancer. Um, we've worked closely with um, um, a group of them to actually sort of um, uh, guide some of the things that they will discuss on there as evidence-based strategies for energy complexity for pain, anxiety, and productivity, and physical dysfunction. And, and now we're actually rolling it out so that clinicians are directly referring patients to other patients in an online environment. Um, another thing that we've done is um, developed a kind of web resource, a print resource, all, all sorts of um, um, evidence-based self-management strategies, print, video, um, that patients can access. Um, but, but that's really just the what. It doesn't help them with the how. How do I actually do this? And so what we've um, started to encourage um, are these things called action plans by which you um, and it, it, it's based in, in self advocacy theory, and it's, it's sort of actually an evidence base around this idea of action planning. But um, um, it's a way to in, involve your caregiver um, in helping you help yourself. So, so in, the, in the clinic, you say, you know what, you can do whatever you want on this website, 
uh, you take something, you plan when you're going to do it, and your caregiver will hold you accountable to that. And that accountability is what helps them you know, do well in that setting. Um, of course, there's other things that I think we're really starting to explore um, in the US context, these are called home and community based services. Um, they're available through so federal and state programs, um, but under access, underutilized, and probably not um, as available as they'd like to be. That can be pretty, uh, or it would make sense for them to be definitely in pretty bad shape to qualify for some of these things. But um, they include things like home repairs and other things that you know, might help someone's capacity. Um, but we have not at all really integrated into the healthcare system. Most physicians or clinicians have no idea that these things are available, or they, we certainly haven't thought about how you would describe them. Um, you, know, you might connect someone to something you might know about, but that's about as far as we can. And, and sure enough, we've seen that when um, healthcare systems do partner with uh, community organizations that do have access and understand these sorts of um, as those um, associations of healthcare use <coughs> And the last thing I would mention are sort of the faith community, which I think some places have done a good job of uh, partnering with, but um, um, it's still, I think, an opportunity. It's, it's a challenge. We've battled it here, but um, I actually know of the healthcare system in Florida, where apparently everyone goes to church in Florida. Right? <laughs> 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 I'm not really sure how they got away with it as far as HIPAA or whatever. What happens in Florida, just speaking of healthcare system, is when a patient is admitted to the hospital, they actually have in the record where they go to church and they call their church. And when they when that patient is discharged, you better believe that that church is going to wrap around that person and provide help and support that otherwise they, they wouldn't have. Or it would, it would fall on, on an under resourced healthcare. Try to figure out how to help that. So I think there's lots and lots of opportunities in that space as well. Okay. So in closing, I think what, what I've been trying to work on over the last five years is thinking about can we develop sort of this other system um, that the patient, you think about the patient's life, you think about why, when it makes sense for them to engage with healthcare for a diagnosis or treatment plan or some information and education, they do that. When it makes sense for them to engage with welfare, with some social support, for some self management, how that sort of thing, that there's something available. And ideally, that the welfare system and the health system work together. Um, it's a vision that I don't think we're there yet, um, but something that, that will work with it. So, in closing, um, I believe health is not achieved at the beginning of a diagnosis or even at the point of arriving at a treatment. It's achieved when patients do the work of integrating healthcare and self care into their lives. This is not work we can or should do for patients, but it is work we can and should support moving from a sick care system to a true healthcare system. Thank you, and I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, Lori. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I've seen this work good and bad. Uh, I think the idea that we have to have a trained moderator. Is really important. I went to a support group and I walked out of it with more burden because everyone I talked to, I started doubting every decision I'd ever made based on these other patients sharing their stories. So that was just a real, like, oh my God, you know, I went home and made an appointment with my surgeon because I thought I had made the wrong decision based on this. And there wasn't somebody sort of coordinating it and prefacing it and saying everyone's different and all kinds of things. Yep. But where I thought it really well in Rochester is uh, who I have a Livestrong program for cancer survivors, uh, where it starts them with exercise and it's, a, it's you get together, you talk, then you go and you work out a little bit. It's very low, threatening, very easy, and it's trained people. There's volunteers, there's hunters from the University of Minnesota that are working with it. And I'm in it now, and it's just an excellent program. It's an excellent example of, you know, how a, a, and it, it gets money from a grant to yeah. do it, but it's, it's just an excellent familiar. example of a program. I think uh, that's a great point, Lori. And, and we did a lot of background research, and I agree completely with your thoughts about support um, groups. That's a 
it's not the same thing as what we were talking about here. And uh, we have some very strict criteria for certified leaders and how they deliver and guide the, the program and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where does the funding come from for Golf Connect? So, funding for the. What did you say? So it's a challenge. The funding for the programs, uh, there is something called the, uh, in the US context, for those of you that are not political, the Administration of Community Living, um, <laughs> which uh, distributes funds to all of the states, um, primarily through the Administration of Aging, which goes to aging services providers. Who then make contracts with community based organizations to provide evidence based self promotional programs. And the programs that they can provide are on a list maintained by the National Council on Aging that have met a certain threshold of evidence that they didn't work. So that's how that happens. Um, but that is, a, <laughs> that is a limited, you know, it's not, it's not like, um, like Medicare that, you know, you have a soft service. You can, it's funded, so it's like a limited amount of money. Um, so the, the, the thing with that is we're trying to work more with health payers to reimburse, which means we have to develop systems by which um, community organizations can fill, which is part of the rationale for developing in the first place, so they can kind of coalesce all of that and then build directly with the payers. That is happening some um, uh, through a, a program up in the Twin Cities. Um, the funding for Well Connect itself um, is through grants, um, some small funding through um, the Bush Foundation, and uh, Mayo has supported a little bit of past research dollars, um, but it's a little bit of a hot pot and it's not necessarily just people. Um, what I have been studying is the um, it's the one where you have a sculpture blob and uh, an arrow coming into a spot. And I made that last night. I haven't had a long time. Which one you're taking it out? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's like that thing where you
then developing their own self efficacy, um, developing the sort of human connection and relationships that promote kind of new norms and new ideas about who they are and what they're capable of. So it's, I, I agree entirely with what you said. Okay, we'll go with Mike first. How many of you are actually and recognize what we do well, what do we not do well, and recognize the ability of others in the agency of recognition. Yeah, so the, the comment was that I'm suggesting that healthcare is an ego check and everything that acknowledge what it does well and what maybe others could do better. And, and sort of um, delegating and supporting um, um, the folks that could do that. And I, that is exactly what I'm suggesting. What might be some, like, I mean, we talked about the creation of networks and the word out, the creation of the awareness. Are there any other things that we can hopefully get us to where we are? Is this an example further down that road? Um, I, mean, I think a lot of it is, is you know, it, it comes to resourcing. So if you look at, if you were to look at the high chart of, the contributions to health and how medical care is a sliver. If you would put a parallel pie chart of um, the resources, the, the, the costs, and all of that, it would be completely opposite, right? So a lot of the, um, and other people have done work on this, that if we resource communities or help communities build their capacity um, to even a fraction, a small fraction of what, how well resourced healthcare is, I think it'd be incredible the sort of transformation you see um, in people's, you know, opportunities to, to thrive. That would, I kind of guess, anyway, that I would suggest. Well, I just had a comment, and I just was wondering about the picture. I just wondered, Victor, I wonder what people would think if you had it as a scale, a patient's life on the scale, yeah. a thin scale, and the, and the healthcare was lower down, and the patients put up. The arrow is really a hand having to put up and keep them while trying to make patients like the same way. The healthcare is yeah, but it's yeah, not to make it's an shouldn't really be applied. Oh, sure. I'll have to think about it. it. This is like presentation one on one, not the new slides <laughs> into your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but the other question I had was you provided um, a slide, just a snapshot that saved you say so much money. And I just wonder how you actually. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. question. So the slide that showed the money saved was based off, of, um, off of, of the programs that had been evaluated to start their effect on cost, which extrapolated that our population made some assumptions that our population would be similar to the populations that were represented in those published studies. So it's not known, and we made a conservative estimate to assume those might be able to be achieved. We are currently um, looking at data of um, participants that allow for us to look at signing consent forms. So we have the participant data. We're trying to match it to um, some clinical healthcare outcome data to see can we detect an effect of actually trying to patient to Yes, yep. I'm just wondering if you're aware of what <laughs> the book's called No More Throwaway. No, no. Um, it's like. Why... What? I love the name. Yeah, well, it's called the co-production imperative. What it tries to do is grow the community development approach by linking need to volunteerism. Um, and it's done here in America, which is where I yeah. discovered it. The thing it needs is for people to map the need yeah. to people who don't have a homicidal tendency. If you know what I mean, so there's some kind of police check between um, some person volunteering. But I think if you're, if you're thinking about where to go further and to grow those resources to support mm -hmm. uh, the community, then, then that might be something that you might want to look to. It's like, um, I'm sure you would be aware of our talk on one day, we need to fit crews and not cowboys and stuff like that. Yeah. So the no more throwaway thing you might be Yeah. What's that called? 
I'm going to match the like the biggest organization in the state for seven, but it's not how it's going to work. So that's the big question. Wait, they have a little bit. I guess the question you were talking mostly about the patient. Are the programs like also like to train the caregiver? I remember when my mom got pancreatic cancer. Luckily, I was a student nurse, otherwise, we'd have lost. We wouldn't have been able to keep her home. Do you do programs then and look at stuff like uh, where, you're care where you're training the caregiver as yeah. opposed to focusing on the patient? We do. There's a program called Powerful Tools for Caregivers, and that's it's a six week program that specifically focuses on the caregivers, which Caregiving in and of itself is sort of like a chronic health condition. I mean, it, it's really it's a real challenge that we get. Yep. So I'm, I'm from the UK, so I'm not quite sure how yeah. exactly the funding system works. But where we, there's a big drive for us. I work in physical therapy and in muscular sleep. There's a big drive for self management patients, visual exercise, education. Um, and there's also a movement to try and push away from orthopedic surgery and kind of alternative ways to manage. Is orthopedic surgery is expensive and it's not always it's not always needed. And there's been a bit of a conflict within where I work. If we find alternative <laughs> pathways that don't lead to surgery, surgery is ultimately what comes up as And I'm wondering with with the sort of delegation to communities and capacity, is how can funding be diverted so that these people aren't volunteers and there's funding from the community to support them? I don't know, but I thought a lot about it. <laughs> I mean, I I honestly think, wouldn't it be cool if we actually had a place to put professionals and move them out of the healthcare system, and so that they're they're serving different needs and different purposes. And um, it's not going to happen in America, but maybe you have a chance to do it there. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next workshop